souls can you deliver to me today? Deliver to you? Take my hand. Walk in the valley of the darkness. Sir? I command thee to Hold deliver on, your souls to me! What if you were in this room that everybody's been in for 20 generations and another aphid came into the ant mound, walked down through the tunnels and said, hey guys, you're not supposed to be here. You don't even belong here. This is the way the Lord explained it to me. This is the way he told me to explain it to you. I know that the end has come and I am encouraging everybody to get one of these, put all this information on it because it's the most valuable information on the planet. Don't be an aphid that doesn't wake up because the end of that aphid is eternal suffering. You're in a, you're in a dimension called the flesh. You're, you're a spiritual being. You're in a dimension that's called the flesh. It's a prison. And it's the, the craziest thing of all is, it's the most grand illusion ever created. It's just an illusion. The whole darn thing. Jesus came into the system. He came into the system via a vehicle, a Mary, a virgin. And he was a holy seed, an incorruptible seed that came into the system that could buy back people that were, you know, under this energy uh, condemnation. Let's call it sin. It, it is sin. but So anyway, every human being in the system is under this energy that's condemned. And then when Jesus comes in, look, he turns you upside down and you get repolarized just like energy. Whoop. And then when when you die, when you die in this flesh, your energy can't go the way it was going to go. It has to go the opposite direction because you've been repolarized.
this video is going to be such a paradox it's going to fly in the face of what most people have believed their entire lives you've been lied to what you thought was life from the moment you were born was actually death you were born into death you're not even alive until you're born again in christ once you're born again then you are alive you're alive in christ here's the scripture wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and christ will give thee light the war began in eden when the dragon known as nakash lured adam and eve into sinning with the lie ye shall be as gods i will exalt my throne above the stars of god soon humans multiplied upon the earth and rather than worship god they fell down at the feet of dragons but it wasn't enough for the dragons they wanted to do more than just own mankind they wanted to destroy them to forever keep them from re-entering the divine council che non hanno imparato a fare il segno della croce. Again, I'm trying to destroy misperceptions. I'm trying to give you perception versus reality. You just saw a video where the Pope said it's disgraceful that the parents have not taught their children to make the sign of the cross. And so the Pope touches his head and he comes down here and goes like that. I was taught to do that when I was a child. If I was to make the sign of the cross like the Pope, I would go like that and like that. So I'm going to measure that. From the middle of my forehead or the top of my head to the middle of my chest, you have 16 inches. And then he goes from here to here and then like this and like this. So that would make an upside down cross. You just made an upside down cross on your body. Let's go look at St. Peter's Basilica. You're looking at an old-timey keyhole right here, just a little one, and there is an upside-down cross, and the keyhole is locked. There's no light coming through this keyhole. This big keyhole, which is the Vatican, when the key went in, see the key that goes in? The key is going to go into the keyhole. When the key goes in, it's going to block the light, and it's going to turn it upside down. to block the light and it's going to turn it upside down and then no more light will come through that keyhole here it is the key went into the keyhole and it turned upside down and when it turned upside down the door was locked and the cross turns into a serpent wearing a crown you're looking at a representation of the garden of eden you're looking at the largest church in the world that claims to be Christian that is in the shape of a serpent wearing a crown. I want you to just think about that for a minute. You've been taken captive in a world where you don't you don't really realize there's a whole nother thing called the kingdom of heaven. It's a different kingdom. It's not of this world. And you're trapped in this world in a host body. Here is a guy walking his dog at St. Peter's Basilica. You see all the cobblestones right there? So there's your entire system right there. You have the serpent blocking the keyhole. There's no way back because you're trapped. The door's been shut. The door's been locked. And you were caught in the flesh. Think how long this has been going on. Do you think God's had enough? I know I've had enough. I can't stand looking at it anymore. All these little kids making upside down crosses. And guess what? There's only one way to get out of this trap that everybody's in. There's one way to get out. You got to take this cross and you got to turn it back the other way if you want to see the truth. So this is your condition right here. You're trapped in the flesh. The only way to get out of the flesh is to be born of the spirit. So you got to get converted before you die. How do you get converted? You turn the key back 
the other direction. And then the door unlocks and you get saved. It's between you and the Lord God, you know. It's people ask me for advice and I'm like, well, confess your sins to God. To admit you're wrong, just like you know, go watch The Passion of Christ, the movie. Um, watch the movie The Passion of Christ and look at the guy on the cross that says, You would be just in condemning me. He said, I have sinned and my punishment is just. This is how simple it is to get saved when you say it with your heart. Because we were exiled from heaven and we're all prodigal sons. I mean, by by definition, listen folks, by definition, you have to be reconciled to God through Christ. Okay, so reconcile means to restore friendly relations between. She wanted to restore friendly relations between her father. It means to make one's peace, to kiss and make up, bury the hatchet, declare a truth, say you're sorry. The only way to get back is to be reconciled. And then what happened is you got put in this system, right side up, upside down. You got one eye good, one eye bad. And the only way to get reconciled is like that. And you confess your sins to God. And you tell him you're sorry. He would be just in condemning you because we're all exiles. We got thrown out because we thought Lucifer had a great plan. His plan kind of sucked. He wanted to kill us all. He said, surely you will not die. Wrong. Everybody dies. And then he gets your soul unless you get reconciled back to dad. So that's why dad, the Lord God, dad, the Lord, you know, my dad, Abba, he came into the system. The Lord God is in heaven. We're on the earth and there's a pit underneath us. All that matters. So the Lord God came into the system. The Holy Spirit entered the system through a virgin, came out in the system, lived a pure and sinless life, and then bought back everyone that would be reconciled, that were duplicitous in nature. Be reconciled to God by the transforming of your mind. And, you know, that's it. It's that simple. It's really simple. You are exiles. We are the exiles. We are the fallen. What do you think you're doing here? Anyway, I've proven it so many times. It's like the people that don't get it, God have mercy for you guys. I mean that. I really, I really mean it. God have mercy on y'all. Try and make your peace as quickly as you can with the Lord God because everything's coming to a close and it's coming very quickly. To come get you and take you home. This is what dad did. Don't ever forget it. Unless you're born again, you'll never see the kingdom of heaven. It is not too late to repent now, for without repentance, no one will be coming to heaven. So many events will make this world chaotic and people confused. I reach my hands to you now. Take my hands and I will lead you to your eternal destination, to heaven with me forevermore. King of all kings, God of all things created. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life.
is I'm going to be connecting the Bible, creation, and science. Are you okay with that? How many love science? How many love it when the Bible proves that science is wrong? How many love it when science proves the Bible's right? All right. Well, tonight we're going to have a combination of the two, and I believe it's going to excite you the way that it excited me. We're going to get into some mysterious scriptures right off the bat in the very opening verses of your Bible. We're going to connect it to the book of Revelation by the time that we're finished here, and I believe that you are going to be illuminated and highlighted in your life, not only with the Creator, but you will see how He sees you, but you will see how how He will, you'll not only see how He sees you, but you'll see yourself differently, and I believe that when you walk out of here, you're going to be a brighter light. Amen? Amen. All right, let's begin. The physical always reveals the spiritual. You know, you hear me say that all the time, and uh, someone once said, man, do you have a scripture for that? Well, I have a scripture for that, because I always say that what happens in the physical, there is a spiritual message. What happens in the spiritual realm manifests itself in the physical realm. That's just the way that it works. We always say, we've said and heard from pulpits our entire life that God manifested himself through his creation. And even if we don't believe, the rocks will cry out. Well, tonight, I give you my word. I'm going to do my best to connect the science on the science level, how that's actually possible. In Romans chapter 1, Verse 20, it says this, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen. Right away, I'm confused. Until you come to this next part. Being understood by the things that are made. Even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they're without excuse. Do you realize what this one verse is saying? It says basically, you don't need anything but creation to know all about God. Every part of Him. And literally, the Godhead. The most mysterious, misunderstood, hard to understand by theologians. And the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans here that, hey, by the way, it's a piece of cake. Look around at the very complex but simple ways that God made His own creation and you'll see the very face of Elohim. And tonight I believe you're going to agree with me as we walk through here. First of all, I want to talk about back to the beginning and describe what light is in the actual Hebrew. It's made up of three Hebrew letters. Aleph. Everybody say Aleph. Vav. Vav. And Resh. All right. Aleph, Vav, and Resh. What that is in the Hebrew, it's actually pronounced or, or ora, okay, if you add a hey onto the end of it. Both of those are the word for light. And so when you take the Paleo Hebrew, which is the ancient pictograph Hebrew, which is my favorite uh, part of the language that it originally was done, just like Egyptian hieroglyphics where every little symbol was a picture and then the pictures make up words and so on and so forth, and every letter has a number attached to it, the Hebrew language is so complex and so beautiful, there is such thing as Bible codes written into the very language itself. There are words that, have, that add up to certain numbers that are connected to other words with the exact same numbers, and you can begin to get a concordance that God made, not man, but God made to help you understand what letter, letters, when they're combined with one another, and those words, and how they're related to other words. Well, when you go back to the original Paleo-Hebrew on the Aleph, it's a ox head, which means the strength of the leader. It's the strength of the leader. The vav is actually something that connects. It's a nail. How many know that the name of God is yod Hey vav Hey, which literally means yod is the right hand of God, He is revelation or revealed, vav is the nail that connects, and He is revelation or revealed or behold, or reveal. So literally the name of God is the right hand of power that connects revelation, the old, hey, what did I do wrong here? No, the right hand of God reveals the nail that brings revelation. 
Yahweh is the right hand of God that reveals the nail that beholds or reveals. And that's exactly what he did. He took the nail and connected it to Yeshua, which brought forth revelation. Well, look what this word means. The very word light means the strength of the leader connects the beginning. Resh is the beginning. So light is the strength of the leader that connects the beginning. The very first two letters in the Hebrew alphabet are what? Aleph, Bet. When you put Aleph, Bet together, Aleph is the strength of the leader. Bet is literally the Hebrew word for house and also means house by itself. It's the strength of the leader of the house. And when you put Aleph and Bet together, those two letters are the word father. Abba. So the very first two letters in the Hebrew alphabet are telling us that the Father is the strength of the leader of the house. How many want darkness in your house or do you want light? So connect it all together. The strength of the leader of the house connects to the people that live in the house the beginning. And I believe that that word light in a Paleo-Hebrew, it's telling us to do something no different than when we tell people about Yeshua, when we give the gospel to someone, what's the first book of the Bible we tell them to read? John. Read the book of John. So they do. And what's the very first verse of the book of John? In the beginning. See, God, like my friend Brad Scott says, the, 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 the God is so smart that He knew millenniums in the past that we were going to skip the whole front of the book. And we were going to send people the book of John. So he inspired John to write in the beginning. Go back to the beginning. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to go back to the beginning. And I believe that we're going to see some mysteries unveiled. Because the Bible says that the end is told from the beginning. Genesis chapter 1 verse 3. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along with me or take notes. But here's what it says. It says, Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the darkness, or excuse me, the light day, and He called the darkness night. Pretty simple, right? Let me read it again. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the darkness from the night, from the light. God called the light day, and the darkness He called night. Now, we've got a problem here. If I open up my scriptures here, what verse was that? That was verse 3. If we just keep going, that was day 1. So the evening and the morning was the first day. So on day 1... God created light and separated light from darkness. So follow along with me. I'm going to be an atheist for just a moment. So God says, in verse 14, Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and seasons, for days and years. And let the lights be in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, to divide the light from the darkness. God saw that it was good, so the evening and the morning were on the first day. Verse 3, then God said, let there be light. And there was light, and God saw that the light was good. He divided the light from the darkness. Anybody see a problem? We have a schizophrenic scripture here because we have light being created and separating itself from darkness on two days. So it's no question that on day four that the light that is being created is the sun, the moon, and the stars. It tells us the greater light for the day, the lesser night for the night, the the lesser light for the night. And he separated light from darkness. So what is being separated on day one? What is this light that's being created on day one? Has anyone ever asked yourself that question? It's a pretty interesting question in my opinion. All three of you think just like me, okay? For the the three of you, I'm going to give you the answer. 
The rest of you can just follow along. What I'm about to share with you, I cannot prove 100% in a scientific world. Because the scientific world says you have to be able to have a repeatable process and you have to be able to observe it. We weren't there. We can't observe it. We don't know exactly. But what I'm going to propose to you is an ancient uh, idea or theory that I believe is supported by all kinds of scriptures. And so what I'm going to go through right now is I want to give you an idea of looking at it a little bit differently. Because we read our Bibles and a lot of times we don't, we read right past the power that's in there. Would you ever agree with me? How many have re read your Bibles now that you've come into the roots of your faith and you're like, oh my goodness, how did I never see that scripture, right? You look at it through different eyes. Well, I want to put on a different pair of glasses on you tonight so that you can see things a little bit differently. So here we go. The Bible tells us that God is infinite. Everyone agree. He's omnipresent. He's in every direction. East, west, north, south. He's everywhere. Is everyone on the same page so far? Good. That means He's everywhere. That means that there is no beginning and there is no end. In every direction. So before God creates the entire universe, we have a problem. God is taking up all the space. He's everywhere. Why did I take this PowerPoint and make it all white? Because the Bible tells us that God is light. And He's spirit. I'll show you those scriptures a little bit later. So if He is light and He is in all directions... Where's the darkness? Doesn't exist yet. So in order for God to actually create, He has to create space to create. He has to create a void. And I'm going to submit the void is actually within Himself. The ancient sages would call it the womb of God. That God actually created space inside of Himself. And inside of that darkness, that's not evil. There is a difference between darkness and evil. The Scriptures tell us that. Darkness is simply where God's not. It doesn't mean it's bad. It just means where God is not, there is perfect blackness. Darkness. Evil is the act that's done inside of darkness. Do you follow me? Ready to go deeper? Okay. i got to go slow because this is a brand new concept for many of you. And again, I'm just positing this as a theory, and I believe that it's going to be backed up by Scripture, and it's going to excite you when you start seeing the Scriptures again from a different light. So then the Bible says, let's just read it now. Verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So he tells you what he's about to do. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And every one of us, most likely, have grown up reading right into this first verse what we already believe because of the English that the earth was without form. So the earth was like this big blob. And then darkness was on the face of the waters, but the waters hadn't been created yet. And so what I want to posit to you that actually if you go back and look at the Hebrew, what it's saying is the earth was without existence. It did not have a form yet. It was void of existence. And the next part can be understood by understanding waters. And it says that the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Did you know that the originally there were seven atmospheres to the earth? Today there's only six scientifically. The seventh one, scientists believe that was colloidal water that was suspended around the earth. All the way up till the time of Noah, go figure. Rain 40 days and 40 nights. It actually was colloidal ice suspended. And that ice collapsed, came through the atmosphere, 
and rain for 40 days and 40 nights as, the, as a p- potentially a rock or a comet hit the earth, broke open the earth, and it's now gushing the waters from under the earth, waters above the earth. You do that all for 40 days, and you probably can flood the whole earth very quickly. So that the waters in Hebrew can mean the face or the edge. And so here's what I believe happened, is that the earth was without form and void. It didn't exist. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water, so He has to create light inside of the darkness. Watch this. The Bible, all the way when you get to the New Testament, we know that the Word of God came in the form of flesh. The Bible says that Yeshua also created. He was the firstborn creation, but he, all things were created through Him, by Him, and for Him. Would you agree? So that means that Yeshua is here at this point somewhere. You follow me? So where is He? Because you have God the Father that is infinite in every direction, and He sends the direct representation, the image of Elohim into the darkness. And in the darkness, at this moment, at this moment, I want to posit to you that science calls this from one atom, and they say it was light. One atom of light exploded. And that light, what they call the primordial light, exploded. They call it the Big Bang Theory. It's not a theory. It's real. The creation of the universe happened in one second. It's the only part they got right. Everything else they got wrong. And the creation of that light exploded inside the womb of God. And that that was the Spirit of God that hovered over the face of the waters. Because the waters in Scripture, if you understand the Hebrew, as I mentioned earlier in one of my messages, that the heavens, which is everything outside of our universe and time-space continuum, The Bible says he calls water. How do we know that? Because the very word heaven is mayim, and the word water is, excuse me, shemayim, and the very word water is mayim. Heavens is made up of two words, shem and mayim, which putting the two together literally is, shem is the name. It means the name of God. It's one of the names of God, Hashem, the name. The name of God. That brings water. But it's spiritual water. You follow me? So God says that the heavens are made up of this spiritual water that is actually light at the same time. Light and water. Believe it or not, science is involved here. Because the fastest production of electricity is water. So what's happening is the Spirit is hovering over the face or the edge of the heaven. You follow me now? How many think that this is just absolutely insane, crazy? Okay. <laughs> That's okay. I debated on two ways to put this together, show you the Scripture first or give you the concept first. So follow along with me because we're going to show you the Scriptures that are going to give a lot of meaning. And you don't have to believe this. But if you don't, you've got to come up with a reason how the light gets created in day one without the light being created in day four. Remember, the Bible says that whatever is created on earth is what? It is an exact pattern of what is in the heavens. So whatever is happening here is happening here. If there's water here, there's water there. And so let's prove this. God said, let there be firmament in verse 6. So then, he, verse, excuse me, verse 3, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light. And I'm going to submit to you that this is exactly the same concept when he says that the light is good, is he said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And he says, I saw the light, and the light was good. And God divided the light, his presence, from the darkness, not his presence. Then God said in verse 6, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, because now we've got waters on the inside of creation, and we've got waters on the outside. And he divides the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under 
the heavens, the firmament, from the waters which were above the firmament. God called the firmament heaven, so the evening and morning was the second day. And so we see literally God creating a space inside of Himself, if you will, where He is about to create the entire universe. Because from there is our universe exists. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 12 says this, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of His hand and marked off the heavens by the span, which is this, and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure and weighted the mountains in a balance in the hills and a pair of scales. God says that I hold the universe in the palm of my hand. To me, this makes a whole lot of sense. God is that big. He's infinite. I don't know about you, even if you don't buy this concept, the concept itself makes God way bigger than you ever imagined. Let's look at a a website, a secular science website called Universe Today. They say the very first photons traveling through the space-time continuum were extremely powerful. This moment of God creating the universe. As a group, they were incredibly intense. As individuals, each vibrated at an extraordinary rate. The light of these primordial photons quickly illuminated the rapidly expanding limits of the youthful universe. Light was everywhere, but matter was yet to be seen. They actually described what I just said. Light came into the universe through one single microscopic cell And the light expanded everywhere. And it was so bright, matter could not even be seen. It was so bright. What happened when Paul fell off the horse? He saw the light and it blinded him. Because the the brightness of the light was so bright, he couldn't see matter at all. And with this, they go on to say, And with all this understanding at the end of the article, beneath our intellectual feet, we can now answer our question. The light we see today is literally the primordial light of creation. In other words, all of the light that you see, the article in depth goes on to say that everything that produces light in the universe originally was infused from a single light source. That stars are not producing light on their own. Stars were infused with light from which they are now expanding that light into the universe. The Bible calls angels stars. That you will eventually be bright as a star. If you look at the, on the science level, the molecular level, stars did not generate their own light. The light originally came from an exterior source and now they are growing in brightness from within. Are you not supposed to take your light from external source, Yahweh, the God of the Bible, and then inside of that, that light is supposed to grow, and you are supposed to get dimmer as He gets brighter on the inside of you. You see, God didn't just pick a star and go, oh, those are pretty. I'm going to make an analogy that they're like those. The very creation of how stars exist is, a, is an example or a beautiful allusion to what, how we're supposed to exist. What is his image? Genesis 1.27 says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. What I want to ask is this. If the God of the universe is infinite in every direction, no form whatsoever, and he is made of perfectly pure light, which is what the Bible says, and he makes man in our image, do you think that he's making man the way that you and I look today? Because that's not what he looks like. God doesn't have skin. He doesn't have flesh, the Bible says. No flesh or blood will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Well, wait a minute. This is a timeout moment. Who's right? Is God lying here? Because if no flesh or blood is allowed in the kingdom of heaven, then the way that we're looking right now can't possibly be the way that He created us because He created us to live in the kingdom. Does that make sense? So I'm going to submit to you this. When you get to Genesis chapter 3, it says, And the Lord God called Adam and said to him, Where are you? 
So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? And so I'm going to submit to you tonight that their nakedness, they could not see it because they were actually exactly the way that they were created was in the image of Elohim. They were light. The image of God was in them so brightly that they were glowing beings. How many remember a Moses on the mountain? How many have ever picked off a piece of skin? I know that sounds gross. What color is it? It's clear. Your skin is translucent. Do you think that that is absolutely just a coincidence? I believe that your outer being is actually a prism that originally was supposed to house on the inside of your DNA such a radiant light that your skin would glow with the light of God. Luke 24, 4 says, While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood before them in dazzling clothing. Now, you can't see this in the English, but watch this. Dazzling in the Greek is estropto, to lighten or a flash. It was light. That's why they used the word dazzling. They were actually beings of light. And we see this all through the Scriptures. Angels, like an Hasatan comes as what? An angel of light. The angels are created as light beings. And we are higher than the angels. Should we be mortal and be, have flesh and blood and be higher at the same time? What's missing? Let's go back to some ancient Jewish sources. Then he came, then came the word, and see what they say about Adam and Eve and what they look like. Then came the word of God to Adam and Eve and said to them, This is he who was hidden in the serpent and who deceived you and stripped you of the garment of light and the glory in which you were. It went on to say, Adam in the Garden of Eden was attired in supernal raiment of celestial radiancy. As soon as he was driven from the Garden of Eden and had need of forms suited to this world, the Lord God, Scripture says, made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. There were garments of light to wit of the celestial light in which Adam ministered in the Garden of Eden. In other words, when, the, when they sinned, our Bibles tell us all the time to walk in light. Do they not? Do not walk in darkness. When you sin, what happens, the Bible says? Your light gets dimmer. Everybody know those scriptures? So you're supposed to walk in light, and when you sin, your light gets dimmer. Well, what happens in the beginning if you're Adam and you are nothing but light? You are a perfect, radiant image of the Most High God, your Father. And you are imaging Him, reflecting His light perfectly. There's nothing in you to dim. And then all of a sudden, guess what happens? You sin, and literally, it snuffs out the light. You look down, and you see what you really are. Naked. And the prophetic significance of connecting this is that when we walk in God's light, you're clothed. When you don't walk in God's light, you're actually walking void. You are as the earth before it's created. You are in darkness. You are in nothingness. How many know that, there, that light is invisible? Look around. Can you see light? You can't see it. Did you know that right now you are actually living scientifically in pitch black darkness? There's no such thing as light in the visible realm. The only reason why you can see is because there is something that is actually reflecting what you can't see. If you take a flashlight and put it in a vacuum room, 100% blackness, and it's a vacuum, and you take the flashlight and you point it away from you, you will not see anything. Complete pitch black. 
with a flashlight on. You can make it a 50 billion watt candlelight. It doesn't matter. You'll see nothing. But the moment you put an object in front of it, you actually see the light. You follow me? God says He is invisible. He's pure light. The only way that you could ever, ever, ever interact or even know that the light exists is for Him to create something. And when He creates something, and I'm going to submit to you that He created His Son to be the lesser light that rules the night. As He is like the greater light that rules the day. And when the light of the Father hits the light of the Son, you have the perfect representation. Does that make sense? He even goes on to say, otherwise he could not have entered there. When driven out, however, he had need of other garments, hence garments of skin in the original Hebrew. Even going to ancient Christian sources, it says, Come then, let us go forward in our discourse and look upon this marvelous woman as upon virgins preparing for marriage, pure and undefiled, perfect and radiating in permanent beauty, wanting nothing of the brightness of light, and instead of a dress, clothed with light itself, and instead of precious stones, her head adorned with shining stars. For instead of the clothing which we have, she had light. This is not the first concept. Ladies and gentlemen, anybody that's looked deep into their Bible and studies it for a living will eventually come to the simple conclusion, God is light, we're created in His image, Yeshua is light, the angels are light, we must have been light. Which makes sense why the entire Bible has got so much light around it. Let's go back to science. Some of you are freaking out at the theology. Science is going to back this up. A biophoton is the emission of light from DNA. Did you know that science has finally discovered, after 6,000 years, that your DNA is actually emitting light? Science has just proved what I just said. You are a light being. You are designed by very God of the universe to hold, absorb, and transfer light. Science is just now on the cutting edge of discovering that light, that, 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 ma- that uh, information is not just traveled along electric lines, that light actually has packets of information built into it. Did you know that right now, overseas, they are doing experiments. You, you think that you have fast broadband now through fiber optics? Do you know what they're doing now? They want to transfer things at the speed of light. They're trying to harness light so that they can, you can transfer information across the world at 186,282 miles an hour. That would make our iPhones a little slow. Praise God, they could use a little light source, couldn't they? Some of our our technology, you, you hit click and you just wait. But God has created us to be light beings. We're supposed to take light and emanate it out. So on a very molecular level, this is what they say in science magazines. They say, when we study the DNA molecule at the, at the, at, with our greatest microscopes, with the greatest tools that we have, we see that there is just a tiny, tiny bit of photon exchange, light that's coming out. What I want to submit to you is if you could go back in time before the sin that's putting the light in its dim state, that DNA was full 100%. Imagine what would happen if light, which we know, how do you know how many medical science has discovered that you actually feel better when you're out in the sun? Do you think that's coincidence? Or do you think that maybe on a scientific and spiritual level that God's trying to tell us something that when you stand in the light, I can heal your body? Have you ever wondered on a spiritual level when somebody lays hands on somebody how they're getting healed? Is because you can't see it because light is invisible. But the light of the Father is reflected through the Son and His blood because life is in the blood 
And on a molecular level, that light travels through you into the being of the other person and it goes to the DNA, lights that DNA up, and heals that man or that woman or that child. It is light. Look it up for yourself. There's light therapies all over the place. There's new sciences that are being developed because of the technology breakthroughs of what they're discovering. At some point, some atheist doctor or scientist is going to go, wait a minute, I remember in Sunday school it said that God is light, that uh, he, we can heal people through light. Where's the light coming from? Maybe they'll finally make the connection. And I'll tell you when it'll be. It'll be literally when they look up in the sky and they see the light coming and they get on their knee and go, okay, I get it. Makes sense. But it might be too late. Watch this. Researchers from the School of Medicine at Kanazawa University in Kanazawa, Japan, confirm the universality of DNA emitting light. They, they add that light is not only emitted, but it's also absorbed by living things. Living things are the only things that absorb light. It has been scientifically proven that every cell in the body emits more than 100,000 light impulses or photons per second. These light emissions, which are not only emitted by humans, but by all living things, are called biophotons and have been found to be a steering mechanism behind all biochemical reactions. The biophotons have been observed and measured using specialized equipment since the 1970s, starting with the pioneering studies of biophysicist Fritz Albert Popp. Since that time, over 30 peer-reviewed academic research papers on biophotons have been published in publicly indexed scientific journals. And they go on to say that every single biochemical reaction in your body happens right after a light emission. Which is what's got them thinking that maybe it's not the electrical currents of the body that are passing information. Maybe it's actually light that is passing information information causing chemical reaction in the body to happen. So then we begin to dig into the Scriptures a little bit. In Exodus 34, 29, some of this is going to make a lot more sense. It came about when Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand. As he was coming down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he was speaking with God, what? Face to face. In Hebrew, panim to pana, the faces or the presence of God. He was in the presence, the very essence and fiber of the infinite one, which is made of what? Light. This was the first time, ladies and gentlemen, since Adam walked with God, that God walked with man. And what happened? On a scientific level, I don't have time to create a bunch of PowerPoints for this, but you have to trust me on this. Don't trust me. Go look it up for yourself. But on the scientific level, we know exactly what happened to Moses' face because science has discovered that when you take light and you intensify it onto an object that has electrons, which all objects do, it excites the electrons and they emit light. How many have ever seen a glow stick? See something glow in the dark? This is exactly how it works in a way is that I have glow in the dark tape that I use when I go camping to put on my ropes. And the only way I can get it to glow is I take my flashlight, I go up to it, and I create a high intense light beam, and it excites the electrons on this tape, and they glow. So Moses was in the presence of a highly intensified light beam. It excited the electrons in his own face. And his face began to do what it did in the garden. It glowed. Let me give you another concept. Did you know that sound actually generates light? In Livermore, California, March 18th, 2009... They say high-frequency sounds have been converted into light for the very first time, according to scientists at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. 
What this means is this. We are finally getting around to what the Bible already gives us a clue to is that every sound that is created, if every fiber of your being is actually light, then what comes out of you is actually light or darkness. You see, what comes out of the mouth of God, that's why Yahweh says, I'm going to create the, wor- the earth through what? My Word. The Word created the heavens and the earth. And what is the Word that comes out of light? Nothing other than light. And because it's invisible, God created our eyes to be able to absorb a certain amount of light to see it. And what I'm going to suggest to you is that there is nothing in our eyes that gives us the ability to see certain spectrums of color coming from sound. But we know from near-death experiences that people tell us that they died, they went, they stood before the Almighty, angels were singing, and literally uh, colors were coming out of their mouth. Their eyes were opened and they could see all of the dimensions, all of the colors, all the frequencies. Rainbows were coming out. Imagine, imagine, because science is actually getting to the place now where, where how many remember Star Trek when they wanted to fix a disease? They got a little sound, went through the body. What was that doctor's name? Dr. McCoy? Is that his name? So he took this little sound instrument, would, would diagnose the frequency uh, 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 that was, that was uh, not at optimal levels, and they would fix it with sound. Well, I want to submit to you that eventually science is going to figure out that they're not fixing it with sound. They're actually fixing it with the frequency of light. How cool is this? Everything that's vibrating is producing a light. And did you know this? Everything is vibrating. Because another science... Uh, system uh, theory is called string theory and is the latest cutting edge in science that they are trying to unravel now is they have discovered that at the at the end of everything when they go deep into the the microscopic levels of everything everything is strings and everything is vibrating at a frequency this is why you can take a crystal glass ever wonder how they can they can break a crystal glass with what their voice how do they do that the person that's singing finds the resident frequency of that crystal because it starts vibrating. The second it starts vibrating a little bit, she's found the, the, the resident frequency. Once you find the resident frequency and you're on that frequency, you simply increase the decibel level. You increase the loudness of it and it explodes. It shatters. So we know that sound, everything is vibrating. Everything is making sounds. And I want to submit that everything is making light. Everything. This is why, think about it, it says that all of creation cries out that God is God. Because if God is light and everything is emanating light, it's literally emanating His presence everywhere. You just can't see it. How many of you, you feel more at peace when you're walking outside in in the woods and creation? Have you ever thought this crazy thought that maybe it's because on a level that you can't see, the creation is emanating, because it didn't do anything wrong. It's actually emanating the light of God that put it into creation, and that light is actually being absorbed by your body, and it's making you feel good, because you're closer to God. How many people say, I feel closer to God when I'm hiking or when I'm out in a mountain or when I'm laying down on the grass. Can I submit that? I don't believe that it's just emotional. I believe there's something on a scientific molecular level that's happening with the light of creation that is inside of you. Now look, I know that that something, oh, that sounds new agey. No, I'm not talking about the new agey garbage because the new age stuff has an end result and motivation that's not God. But how many believe that in every religion there are truths? And sometimes they get on to something that might be true, but they're interpreting it wrong. Just like you have different religions that they have an idea who God, they know there's one true God, but they're interpreting it wrong. Doesn't mean they're wrong that there's not one God. You ready to keep going? All right. 
God is light. 1 John 1, 5. Here's the scripture for you. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light. And in him there is no darkness. There is no void. Yeshua is light. John 12, 46. I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. Now, the rest of this presentation, I'm going to be showing you a bunch of scriptures that have to do with light. And the reason why I felt like I needed to go through the whole entire first uh, beginning and all the science is so that when we read these scriptures, you're going to read them totally different. Because now, the word light, when it says, I have come as light, it's not metaphorical. It's reality. He's coming as the primordial light of God, which is light. He is light. It's real. It's not an analogy. It's not a simile. It's not a fictitious fantasy. It is, it is, it is the reality. He's actually being literal. Colossians 1.15, he is the image of the invisible God. Why is God invisible? Because he's light. And light is completely invisible. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. Matthew 17, 2, and he was transfigured before him. So at the transfiguration of Christ after his death, his face shone like the sun. And his garments became as white as light. Do you see this? Yeshua turns into a light being. I know that sounds like some weird movie. But it's about time that us believers wake up to the scientific realm of the Bible of what it actually is saying. It's not giving you an analogy or some you know, metaphorical idea. He's saying he was transformed into light. Because that's what his father is. The Greek word, by the way, here is phos, from which we actually get the word photon. The very scientific word of photon, which is the light, is right here. He was transformed before them. His face shone like the sun. His garments became his light. You are the light. So God is the light. Yeshua is the light. Matthew 5, 14. You're the light of the world. How many of you just thought, well, that's just a really neat idea. That's a really neat thing, man. You know, Thomas said and created the light bulb. Yeah, I get it. We're the light of the world. I feel happy. No. Look at the incredible connection that we're making. God is light. Yeshua is the, invin the invisible or the visible representation of that invisible light. And then he says, by the way, you are now the visible of the invisible. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand. It gives light to everyone that's around it. We're not created to be this. Look, we, have, we come out of Greek philosophy. We read the Bible from a philosophical perspective. And I want to submit to you that what if God actually meant what he said? What if he's not being cute? What if he really means you are the primordial creative light that created the universe and I am living myself through you to the world? What if it's not metaphorical when you lay hands on someone they get saved and they get healed that it's actually the light of creation that has been passed down through time, through the remnant, through the Messiah, through you and it has nothing to do with you. No man can take the glory of God because you know what the glory of God is? It's the light. It's himself. Walk in the light. John eleven ten 10 says, but if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. See how we're reading this different? It's not metaphorical. It's real. It's God living in you exciting the electrons how do you how is it possible that an unsaved person could actually get saved when they hear the gospel what is happening i'm going to submit to you that there is something actually we call it supernatural you know why because we hadn't figured it out yet 
But the more I study and the more that I start to look for the science in the Bible, the more I realize that it's not supernatural. It's actually the way it's supposed to be. It's natural. That God uses science. And so I want to submit to you that when someone that is unsaved hears the gospel, what's happening is on a molecular level, they only exist, the Bible says, because God breathed life into them. And they're emitting the very DNA, the very photons from their DNA, which is actually God, because all light comes from the original source. So what happens is when the gospel goes forth, and I speak, or a man or a woman speaks the very words of God, you are literally placing yourself back in creation where the word created and the light displaced the darkness. And when the light goes out, it hits those neutrons, protons, and electrons, it excites the DNA, the original light source, it begins to glow, Paul says, fanned into flame, what's inside of them, and they respond to the gospel, or should I say, the light. The Bible says it this way in the Psalms, deep calls to deep. And I'm telling you, I don't believe that it's spiritual. I believe it's actually, it's only spiritual from our perspective, that it's actually physical. God created us to be spiritual beings that operate in a science level. They're not separate. There's no supernatural spiritual realm and then the scientific realm. God created science. Science keeps trying to divorce itself from its origin, and all the more, the more that they keep zooming in, that at the end of the day, they go, man, I, I just see light. And we can't figure out how it keeps emanating itself and producing more light from nothing. Because God is infinite source. 1 John 1, 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of the son of Yeshua, Jesus' son, cleanses us from all sin. So the question we need to ask ourselves is how do we walk in the light? Because I've always grown up thinking, well, that's just really, that's a nice concept. But it's actually real. Watch this. Revelation 19.8 says, It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saint. So every single righteous act that you do on a scientific level produces more light. Every single good deed. Doesn't it feel good when someone gives you something or does something for you? What if, I know I'm crazy right now, but just like, Bear with me. What if the emotion that you're feeling is actually the stimulation of the light of the Word of God that's coming through them? What if it's not an emotional thing? What if it's actually the emotional system being put into gear by God and His light? So what if you could actually do that at 100% all the time? Be pretty happy. The word light there is lampus, where we get the word lamp from. Bright, clear, fine, gorgeous, shining, splendid. The very fabric that God puts on His bride is a shining, bright, splendid, gorgeous, light garment. It's a garment of light. Think I'm crazy? Revelation 15, 6. And the seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the temple clothed in linen, clean and bright, girded around their chest with golden sashes. Psalms 104 one says, Blessed the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a cloak. Matthew 13, 43 says, Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Daniel 12, 3. And they that be wise shall shine in the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Do you see what this is saying? This is not an example or an analogy. When you are in the kingdom, your robes are robes of righteousness that are shining like the sun. So when you are in the kingdom, he means it. You literally will be as the brightness in the firmaments. You will compete with the stars. Other galaxies, if they exist, they'll look at ours and go, look at the stars. 
And there actually may be you. Isaiah 59, 17, he put on righteousness like a breastplate. Watch this connection. And a helmet of salvation. We see that in the New Testament, right? Same exact concept. So the Apostle Paul, when he gives that, is not making it up. He's pulling it because he knows the Torah. He knows the prophets. He knows the only scriptures that existed in the first century. He's quoting God. So we better find out when he defines it, what exactly is a helmet of salvation? What is the righteousness like a breastplate? Because there's only one breastplate in ancient Israel. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness and let your godly ones sing for joy because the only breastplate that you find in the Bible is the high priest breastplate. So let's find out what this is all about. It's a breastplate of righteousness. This is where it gets cool. Exodus 39, 9 says, They made the breastplate square by doubling it. There were twelve stones, according to the names of the sons of Israel, according to their names, engraved like a signet, each one with its own name, according to the twelve tribes. So look what you have. If you look deep into the Scriptures on how God gave instructions on what the high priest should actually wear, every garment is made of linen. Linen, according to science, has the highest frequency of all fabrics. It is the greatest conductor and, and the, uh, of electricity that any fabric can have. It harmonizes the rest of the frequencies in the body. You put wool with it, wool has this exact same frequency. That's why the Bible says don't wear wool and linen together because they cancel each other out and creates a negative frequency on the body. He's a pretty smart science guy. We haven't even figured that out until just now. But back to our example, he tells the high priest to wear two main colors, white and blue. And then he's got the other colors that are from the, the, uh, the curtain in the holy place of the scarlet and the blue and the white and the purple, which tell the, the gospel story, which I don't have time to go into, built into what you see as the fabric that the stones are actually on. But you see the white and then you see the blue ephod. I'm going to submit to you that is absolutely intentional. Because the white represents the perfect color of Yahweh Himself, the Father God, infinite in every way. Every color of the rainbow is represented in white. Blue is the very cover that He puts over the Ark of the Covenant. The only color He puts over the Ark of the Covenant is blue, which is the royal divine color, which is Yeshua Himself. So you have the Father which is white, every color. You have blue, which is the divine color of God, which is why you see the sky that's blue. The oceans are blue. Everybody's favorite color is what? Blue. The color that servants wear around the world and every color is what? Blue. Police. There's a reason for it. Because it goes back to the high priesthood that I want to submit to you that the reason why God had the high priest wear this is because it's prophetic to what man was actually supposed to look like in the garden. So let's take the high priest from 2,000 years ago, put him back in the garden before man's sin where he doesn't have skin. What's on the inside of him? Light. Light is coming, and the light will go through the only garments that have the highest electro frequency of linen that shine brightly when light is put through them on a molecular level. And that light actually penetrates through the breastplate. This is why I believe that those stones are there is because they are actually prophetically showing us What would happen? And I believe every one of you, when I show you this, are going to make a connection that there's a reason, ladies and gentlemen, why you see rainbows in the sky. It's because if if that high priest could actually be who he's created to be, what would come out of his chest would literally be a rainbow. With the white and the blue showing through. And what do you see when you look up in the sky? You see white, you see blue, and you see a rainbow. And the rainbow in Genesis 9 says, I set my rainbow in the cloud. It shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Just an idea, just a thought. But if the high priest was actually in the garden, he would literally be emitting light. I had a dream once exactly on my uh, going into my 40th year. So when I turned 39, on the morning of my birthday, I had a dream. 
And I saw the hand of God take a stone on the breastplate of a high priest, and he put this stone on a chest. And when it hit the chest, it exploded with a light beam from that chest. Makes sense to me. If the chest is connected to the light. Okay, I know this is an crazy message. I'm going to get so many emails, it's not even funny. Revelation 4.2, Immediately I was in the Spirit. Behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he who sat on the throne was like jasper and sardis stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne. Why is there a rainbow around the throne? When the high priest would give the ironic blessing, he would literally put his hands like this in front of his chest. And he would say the ironic blessing and nobody knows. Why? But we do know that when you pray for someone, they can get healed through the light or the frequency that comes out of your mouth. What if in ancient Israel, he had them do this because when he does, I can't do it like Spock does it, okay? But when he does this, Yahweh Himself, which they would never see because light is invisible, is actually filling the high priest and the light is coming straight out His chest, which represents all of Israel. And the colors of all the tribes are actually being penetrating on all of them, the light of God and the blessing of God. Just an idea. Luke chapter 2, verse 9, And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. The glory of the Lord shone around them. What is that glory? Isaiah 46, 13 tells us, I bring my righteousness near, it shall not be far off, my salvation shall not linger, and I will place salvation in Zion, for Israel is my glory. You are the glory of God. You were created as beings that are supposed to take His glory. See, from our perspective, God's glory is His presence. You understand that? There's two different glories. It's our perspective and His. From our perspective, God's glory, when we're in God's glory, we're in His presence. From God's perspective, His glory is manifested through us. Because His glory is His presence, which is light. And so when we're in His presence, we literally are like Moses. You're absorbing the light of God, and it emanates into every fiber of your being, and it comes out of you. His people, Israel, are His glory when they're emanating the perfect image of His being. Job 18.5 says this, Indeed, the light of the wicked goes out. And the flame of his fire gives no light. On judgment day, it's real simple. What causes them to exist is light. They stand before his throne. And they are no more. Job 33.30 says, To bring back his soul from the pit that he may be enlightened with the light of life. Again, I believe it's literal. Let's define light in a different way. Proverbs 6.23, God says, For the commandment is a lamp, and the teaching is light, and reproofs for discipline are the way of life. Psalms 119.105, we're almost done. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn and I will confirm that it, I will keep your righteous ordinances, your commandments. God's law, His commandments, His teachings are our path. They're our light. There's no way to get around it. It's all over the Bible. When you break down the actual word Torah in the Hebrew, this is incredible. The word Torah, in, when you break it down to its original root word, all of these words are connected to it. Ora is light. More is teacher. These are all the same root Hebrew letters. Yore uh, is former rain. Ever heard of the former and latter rains? Yara is to aim. Anybody know what the definition of sin is? It's missing the mark. Do you think that they just came up with that? 
In the original Hebrew, that's exactly what sin was. Because to hit the mark is to aim for what God said to do. When you do it, you're hitting the mark. When you don't do what God says to do, your aim is off. And ra'ah is to see. So what you see is the word Torah is actually connected to the word light, teacher, the reign of God, to aim and to actually see straight. Which is why David says, your word is a lamp unto my feet. It lights my path. It's my teacher. That's why Yeshua is called rabbi, the teacher of what? He's the word of God made flesh. What was the word of God in the first century when there's no New Testament? It wasn't the Koran. We start with the first day. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And on the last day, in the millennium, it says this, no longer will you have the sun for light by day. This is the proof that this is not metaphorical or analogous. Nor for brightness will the moon give you light, but you will have the Lord for an everlasting light and your God for your glory. And the very last Part of Revelation says this in 21-23, And the city had no need for, for the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illuminated, and its lamp is the Lamb. Do you catch this? It didn't say that the light was the Lamb. It said the lamp was the Lamb because the light is from His Father. The infinite one who is displayed through the lamp stand, which is why the lamp stand is called the menorah. And the menorah is literally represented by the word of God in the holy place, lighting up the holy place. The original lamp was the menorah which has 66 pieces, 39 on the left and 27 on the right. 39 books on the left, 27 on the right. The very Word of God existed in the first template and is the Word of God that exists in the last template on the last day. You, ladies and gentlemen, He's telling us that the Messiah is going to be the representation of the light of the Eternal One in the millennium, in the temple, in the holy place. You are commanded by God to be a perfect refraction of the original light in your holy place, in your temple. You're supposed to glow. Have you ever been around someone that they're just glowing? Most of those people are right before they get married. And then what puts their lamp out? Words of death. Power of life and death is right here. Because the same, you're made in the image of God, the world was created from right here. And the Bible says that by His Word, everything is held together. And science has figured out that what is holding the universe together, all the space that they think is empty, they've discovered that it's not empty space. It's strings holding everything together, vibrating. They said actually, sound is actually holding the universe together. And I submit it ain't sound. It's the Word of God vibrating from creation. His very Word is eternal, and it's holding together the universe. And when He stops speaking, the planets will fall. The earth will be destroyed at the sound of His great name. Stand with me tonight, please. Amen. God has designed you to be a prism. When you let His light shine through you, this is why the front of the book is so important. Because on Mount Sinai, He said this, He said, blessings and curses I put before you. I don't want curses to come into your life. But the more of my word that you keep, the more blessings that I can give you. 
Did you know that God doesn't make you do anything? You don't have to keep the Bible. You don't have to keep His Word. You don't have to do anything. God is a benevolent God that just sits there as pure light and says, if you want the fullness of what I have for you, then enter into my presence. And the only two times that the actual presence of God showed up in visible format in human beings was in the garden when we were doing what God said to do. It went away when we broke His word because the enemy said God didn't mean what He said. And the other part is Moses on the mountain when he's receiving the Torah. Do you think that there's any kind of prophetic connection there? He gets the commandments of God and his face lights up. The more that you do what God tells you to do, the more your life will transform into what you were originally created to be. Amen? Let's pray. I love God's